You know, I say uh, a little later on that I'm a chronicler, an elegist, um, a dissenter, uh, all of the above. I wanted to, I was born in 1947. Um, my mother died last year at 98. I wanted to really record a particular way of living as um, a person of color, as a person taking great pride in um, being this, this, in this um, haute bourgeoisie, as my mother once very wisely said when I um, said, are we upper class? Because someone had asked me this at school. She said, well, we are considered upper class Negroes, we are considered upper middle class Americans, and there are many white people who just want to consider us more Negroes. So, you know, I wanted to capture all of those distinctions and negotiations and certainties at the same time that uncertainties were going on everywhere. Just always identity being confronted and confounded. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to get the rituals of a world that still exists, but that, not, you know, not in the same way. And that's why I had to use that that word. And land, for, by land I mean literally the, you know, the geographical boundaries that we all know perfectly well in a city that have to do with you know, class, ethnicity, race, um, you know, you're, but also that sense that we were between, we were bordered on one side by the larger world of blacks, on the other side by white, a, white people, some of whom we knew, most of whom we didn't. Also, a land is, is a mythic space. You know, every, anyone who's had to leave their homeland, you know, knows that it's in your heart and in your brain, um, and it shapes your unconscious as well as your conscious. So I wanted that sense, too. And as you're unpacking Negro land, I got a sense that you, in many ways, opened a window that very few people get to peek into. And I felt, on some level, you were telling uh, stories that have been secret to a mainstream audience. As I look in this audience, many people have never been to Negro land, <laughs> not the Negro land that you grew up in. And I'm like, why, why are you telling so many secrets in here about what's going on in our culture, in our community? Well, I'm not by any means the first, um, no, I, but probably but you know, you we, do it more we may than know the, the fiction, than, you know, the novels, short stories, plays a little better. Um, I had to struggle with that. And then I thought, um, you know, because the pressure, and I, this is not just the way I grew up or when I grew up. When you belong to um, a group that is discriminated against, whose, whose value um, is always being debated, you can be black, you can be all manner of things, you can be a woman, you know, some sense of protecting your reputation is always there. You know, oh, is that, did, was that done by, oh, no, please, that crime, no. <laughs> because you're always contemplating and, and confronting how a stereotype might jump up and hit you and finish you off, or how you might embody a stereotype. So you start, you're taught to be very careful about saying or doing anything that gives prejudice, as we used to say, or bigoted people ammunition. And part of that is you don't, you don't tell family secrets that aren't flattering. Family in the sense of your people, as well as your immediate family. But I thought that could be, you know, as a writer, an interesting tension for a memoir, because I was also interested in what a memoir, you know, can do that's full of, that's full of, in, in conflict almost with, oh, I'm telling my story, you know? I, I almost called this, uh, the subtitle was almost a cultural memoir because it's, it, it is the story of a culture and the story of, a, of an individual, a personality within that. You know, if it were a novel, I'd have been the lead character, but absolutely, whoa. <laughs> and don't knock over glasses That's in right. public, Marco yeah. Jefferson. <laughs>